you know, I intended, uh, before today, I thought I would, I intended to copyright my lecture, but after <laughs> listening to <laughs> Stefan's talk, I decided not to do it. Uh, now, uh, what I want to uh, talk about today is, uh, I'm going to discuss a bit about what uh, the, what's called the, I call the everyday logic of economics, and then give some examples of how this uh, everyday logic functions. Uh, let me see, I have, this is very high tech, so I'm not sure I'll be able to work this properly. Oh, good. Let's see, what did I say here? Uh, now, if you look at, uh, compare Austrian economics as you find it in the works of Mises and Rothbard, say with uh, mainstream economics that you find in journal articles, if you look in American Economic Review, you'll notice, or what you would learn in most mainstream universities, you'll notice a very marked difference, not only in the content of what's taught, but in the manner of presentation. If you look at uh, Mises and Rothbard, Austrian economics, the but the works are written in ordinary language, and the reasoning is conducted informally. It isn't set up in, you don't have a lot of use of mathematics or formal axioms with derivations. And this is not just the reverse in mainstream economics. In mainstream economics, you have uh, all sorts of math, mathematical equations, you'll have axioms and then various, uh, there'll be deductions from the, these axioms that are carried on formally, and then these will be tested. If you, if you, so it, then, in, of course, in econometrics, you have pages of statistics. So you can tell if it's a mainstream text, it'll look like a railway timetable as opposed to Austrian economics. Uh, that was a joke you were supposed to laugh. <laughs> I, I have to deal with the material I come up with. You know, I mean, uh, so what I want to do is we can draw a kind of a parallel here with the situation in philosophy in the 20th century. Uh, at the beginning of the 20th century, uh, Bertrand Russell and other philosophers thought that a problem with philosophy was that people kept disagreeing, and the reason, or a reason they disagreed was that they used inexact language. So Russell and others, such as the logical positivists, thought that if we replace ordinary language with exact terms that are very exactly defined, we could get a, a scientific language, and then we'd be able to solve all the philosophical problems or show that these problems were pseudo-problems, not real problems. We could just, by getting everything into an exact language, we could replace all the ambiguities and uh, vaguenesses of ordinary language that led to confusion. So after this movement had been around for a while, there was a reaction against this called ordinary language philosophy. People such as uh, uh, J.L. Austin in England, Gilbert Ryle, and uh, were partisans of ordinary language philosophy. Uh, the later Wittgenstein was also uh, allied with them to some extent, although he's not a standard ordinary language philosopher, but he also uh, spoke and wrote in ordinary language. So the people in this movement, and here there's rather parallel with the, with the Austrian economists, said uh, ordinary language is perfectly all right and we can reason in that way. We don't, this uh, idea that there's something wrong with our ordinary language that has to be replaced by a scientific language isn't correct that ordinary language makes certain distinctions that are very important that aren't really replaceable. So I think we can see the Austrian economics is 
rather parallel to that, that Austrian economics is reasoning in an ordinary way. Uh, now, uh, how does the Austrian, Austrian economics work? Well, uh, this you'll already be familiar with, with from some of the earlier lectures in your reading. Uh, what we do in Austrian economics is start with a true premise and reason deductively from that. And again, this is all done in ordinary language. Say we start with the, pref the premise that human beings act, and then we try to deduce things from that. Uh, either we're, we're deducing consequences from that, or we're trying to uh, make explicit what's involved in the concept just by thinking about the concept of action. We're trying to figure out what's involved in this concept. And again, this is done in it just by, not by any formal process where we set out uh, symbols, sort of have an axiom system that's set out symbolically and then we follow certain formal rules. We're just thinking about what's involved in the concept of action and what follows from it. Uh, now, the question would, we could ask is, well, why should we do it this way? Why should we start reasoning in this informal way, starting with a true premise and reasoning deducting from it? Well, of course, the reason to do that is if we start with a true premise and then reason validly, that means reason in accord with the rules of logic, then it's guaranteed that what the conclusion will also be true. Supposing to take the familiar example, we, we say we have, we start with a premise, all men are mortal, then we have Socrates as a man, we conclude Socrates is mortal. So if the two premises are true, then it's guaranteed that Socrates is mortal. It follows deductively from the premises that Socrates is mortal. So if the premises are true, then the conclusion is also true. Now, what happens if the premises aren't true? What happens, suppose we have a uh, premises that aren't true and we reason validly from those, what would happen then? Uh, can anybody, does anybody have an answer to that? Uh, yes, yeah. pardon? Uh, well, uh, it wouldn't have to be, I mean, remember, I'm specifying that the reasoning is valid, so it isn't committing a fallacy. We're just starting with wrong premise. Uh, uh, yeah, yes, that's right. It, it, it isn't guaranteed that the statement is false. All that we have is, all that we know is, if you start with true premises and then you reason validly from them, then your conclusion is true, but if the premises aren't true, then we don't know whether the conclusion is true. That would just depend on the individual case. And it's also the case if we start with true premises and we reason invalidly, then we don't know whether the conclusion is true. So you could have cases, say, where well, let's take this case. Suppose we have uh, all men are immortal. Socrates is not a man, therefore Socrates is mortal. So we have here, we have two premises are both false. We had all men are immortal and Socrates is not a man. And we've reasoned invalidly. It doesn't follow from all men are immortal and Socrates is not a man, that Socrates is mortal. Uh, you can see why that's invalid because we didn't say only men are immortal, we just said all men are immortal. Then I said, then the next one was Socrates is not a man, so it doesn't follow from that that Socrates is mortal, but nevertheless it's true, Socrates. So we have here, it's a case of reasoned invalidly from false premises, but we come up with a true conclusion. So again, what the thing to remember is if you start with a true premise and reason validly, then you'll get a true conclusion. And another thing we know is that 
if you reason validly and you have a false conclusion, then one of at least one of the premises is false. So this is the basic way, the basic thing to remember in deductive reasoning, and this is the way Austrian economics proceeds. Uh, so if, say again, we're, we reason validly, we know the conclusion is true. So supposing, say, we're thinking about action, and we think it's inherent in the concept of action that an actor will choose his most highly valued preference. Say we think this is part of the concept of action. A person will have various choices and he'll rank these and then he's going to choose the one he values most highly. So if we were correct that this is part of the concept of action, then we don't have to keep testing. We don't have to keep uh, trying out, uh, well, uh, let's do a survey. Do people always choose their most highly valued action? We know it's true, so we don't need to test it. I mean, if we wanted to engage in experimental philosophy, if there is such a thing, we could try to do that, but there'd be no, no, it would be no point to it because it's once we it follows from the true premise, then that's all we need. So uh, now, as I mentioned, it's essential in doing this kind of reasoning that we start with a true premise, because if we don't start with a true premise, remember, it's not, even if we reason validly and the premise isn't true, then we, uh, we aren't guaranteed that the conclusions will be true. So we have to start with the true premise. But we're fortunate in Austrian economics, we do know the premise, the action axiom, human beings act, is true. This is something that we just we think about, we see that it, we can grasp immediately, it's true, it's self-evident. Now, what do we mean when we say that something is self-evident? Uh, means that we can directly grasp it's true and our reason for thinking it's true doesn't depend on something else. Uh, we could come up with uh, uh, examples where we think something is true, but we think it's true because it follows from, say, some argument that we believe. This is the conclusion of some argument. So if we say something is self-evident, means that we just directly grasp it to be true, and it, uh, our seeing it's true isn't dependent on anything else. Uh, now, some people think, well, a self-evident proposition is one where I just, when I see it, I have some feeling, I have some kind of mental feeling, I, I see this is true, and the reason it's true is that because I just have this feeling of certainty about it. I just say, well, of course, all human beings act. I just have this feeling it's certain, so that's why I believe it's true. But you see, if that were why you believe this statement is true, then it wouldn't be self-evident. Say, Suppose you said, well, I have this feeling of certainty. I'm certain I have this feeling, so therefore I believe that this statement is true. Now, can anyone tell me why wouldn't it be self-evident if that were why I believe it? I, have a, I say, well, I'm just looking at that. I feel I have this feeling it's certain, so I... Therefore, I believe, uh, yeah. Uh, well, <clears throat> uh, I'm not sure that's true. I mean, supposing, supposing I were to start uh, ranting and raving, assuming I'm not, I, I, when I say start, I suppose I'm, begging, I'm making an assumption. That, but uh, I mean, I suppose, you, why couldn't you say that you could see that I'm angry, ranting and raving. And also, supposing you were correct that no one could observe how I feel, 
how would it follow, what would that have to do with why it would be wrong, what would be wrong with saying it was self-evident to me that might be a reason for thinking other people couldn't know whether I think it's self-evident, but why would that be a reason for thinking that it's not self-evident? Uh, anybody else? Uh, yes. Uh, well, I argue, though, I mean, the statement, this is self-evident, and I have a feeling, or seems to me, that this is self-evident, don't seem to me at all the same assertion. Uh, I, yes, uh, you want another chunk? You're, you're using your feeling of certainty as evidence for the fact that it's self-evident that you mean the concept of you using your feeling as evidence. Yes, yes, that's it exactly. Good. I'm glad. Go to the head of the class. Yes, that's <laughs> excellent. Yes, you see, uh, this is exactly right, you see. If I said I was basing this feeling, this, my uh, belief in the statement on some feeling of certainty, then it would be based on those feelings. It wouldn't be not, it wouldn't be the case. It wasn't based on anything. It would be based on that feeling. This point was made by the great British philosopher Jean Moore. It's a very important point that's often missed. When you say something is self-evident, you're not saying that it's something that you have, a, you believe because you have some feeling of certainty about it, you directly grasp it. Uh, uh, now, I want to <clears throat> raise an objection to what I've been saying so far is I said that Austrian economics uses ordinary or common sense reasoning. It's not, it doesn't involve any appeal to pre, uh, formal systems or, or, or controversial concepts, but one could say, well, is that really the case? After all, don't Mises and other uh, Austrians speak about synthetic a priori propositions, or actually Mises doesn't really say synthetic a priori, he talks, at least he talks about a priori propositions. Uh, you remember in Hans Hoppe's lectures, he was discussing a pri synthetic a priori truth and giving arguments against the logical positivists. Now, I think these arguments against logical positivists are very good ones. I'm going to be discussing logical positivists on Friday if I live that long. <laughs> Maybe I'll be discussing them even if I don't. You never know. But, so you might say, well, even if these are good arguments against these, uh, uh, on these topics, they're certainly not common sense points. You have to learn a lot about philosophy and able to be, in, in order to understand what's going on and with all this talk about the a priori or uh, necessary proposition. So how could we say that this is, Austrian economics is a matter of common sense reasoning. Well, I think the thing to bear in mind here is that these philosophical theories are defenses of Austrian economics against people who criticized it. They're not in, in intrinsic parts of the theory. It's just that the logical positivists and others raised questions. They said, well, you're making certain claims about how economists know things, and these claims violate certain philosophical principles. So what uh, Mises and other people did when they talked about uh, a priori knowledge was try to come up with a defense against the positivists. But you don't have to, you don't have to uh, accept that. I think you should accept but You don't have to in order to engage in Austrian economics. All you have to do is accept that the action axiom and the other starting points, like the assumption that uh, labor has disutility, are true. Once you know they're true, again, when you reason from them in a valid way, then what follows is true. So you don't 
you don't need to worry, at least if you want to do Austrian economics rather than methodology, whether the propositions are a priori or what the nature of analytic proposition is. These are just philosophical points of great interest uh, to philosophers, but this isn't really part of the actual economic theory. Now, one uh, thing I think is very important to realize here, it's a mistake that's sometimes made, is if we, if we say, well, the prop, uh, say we say the statement, the statement is true, but people say, well, what if it's an empirical claim, then people think, well, it, unless it's a priori, then if it's just a statement, an empirical statement, then we can't be sure about it. It's always something that will be just a hypothesis and subject to test, so we don't really know something unless we can say it's a priori. And so if this was right, then I would be wrong in saying that we don't have to bring in all this material about the a priori in order to understand, in order to do Austrian economics. It wouldn't just be a side philosophical it wouldn't be just a philosophical defense. We would really have to uh, know this stuff because otherwise we couldn't be certain about it. But the, it's very important to bear in mind that many empirical statements, many statements about the world, are certain. They're not something that we have to keep testing to find out whether they're true. Now take another example. Again, this is one from G. Moore. Suppose I say, uh, the earth has existed for a long time before I was born. I'm not that old. So I think I can say I'm certain about that. It's not something that we're going to find out. Well, the geophysicists have miscalculated. Actually, uh, the, the earth came into existence only a few years before I was born. That's not going to happen. So we shouldn't think if we have a, just a straightforward empirical statement that it's doubtful or subject to continued test. That would be a basic fallacy. So that's why I say we don't. We can still say Austrian economics involves just common sense reasoning because it's not a good objection to say well, but it has to have this. It makes all these claims about a priori knowledge, which it, it, it doesn't involve common sense, because we don't have to say that it's a priori. I think there are good arguments that it is, but we don't have to say that in order to engage in Austrian economics and know that the Austrian propositions are correct and are true. Uh, now, I want to deal with another objection here, which I think is one that's philosophically interesting. Uh, you, you might not think so, but I do, and I'm the one who's giving the talk, so <laughs> that's, that's what counts. Uh, so now, it sometimes happens, hey, if we look at history of science, that beliefs that people take to be obviously true turn out not to be true. For example, it doesn't seem to us now that the, we don't feel that the earth is moving, at least if, well, I, I felt that way, but it's sometimes it's usually just before I pass out, but <laughs> usually we don't feel that way, we don't feel that way, but we nevertheless have good reason to believe that the earth is moving at a very rapid rate of speed. So the argument sometimes been given is, well, science very often sometimes overthrows our common sense beliefs. So even if we think uh, that certain common sense beliefs about economics are true, say maybe this isn't the proper way to do science because what if science shows that Human beings don't act. How do we know that future science won't show that this is just one of those beliefs we had that turned out to be wrong? Well, here I think the basic fallacy in this sort of argument 
is that it, if we've sometimes been wrong about things we take to be obviously true, that would just show we have to be very careful when we make a claim that something is obviously true. But if we really look over the claim carefully and we think it is true, then we don't have a good reason to doubt it just from the fact that we've made mistakes in the past doesn't show that for every claim we make now, that claim is possibly wrong. That wouldn't follow at all. You see the difference there. The claim would be, somebody said, well, I've made claims that have turned out to be wrong in the past, therefore, what I'm saying now is possibly wrong, even though it seems certain to me that doesn't follow at all. That, that's a, that type of argument, incidentally, is one that is, I think, a basic problem with certain arguments for philosophical skepticism. They would think that, well, we've made certain mistakes, we can made certain mistakes, so therefore, possibly everything we believe is a mistake. For example, just to give an example, it's a bit of a digression. I don't think that much of a digression. Well, that could be a mistake, too. Uh, suppose somebody said, well, uh, sometimes people are uncertain whether they're dreaming or awake. Sometimes you have a very vivid dream, and you're not sure, is this really happening, or am I dreaming? But it doesn't follow from that, that for all I know, I might always be dreaming and might always be unable to distinguish them just from the fact that in some cases I couldn't. So this is a, not a correct way of reasoning. Now, now that we've gone over some of the basic points about how Austrian economics reason does in this ordinary or common sense way, I want to give some applications of how you could reason in this common sense way about economic issues. And I'm going to be especially concerned with normative economics, how we make certain claims about what the best economic system is or what should or shouldn't be done, their relation to descriptive statements about economics. Now, you'll sometimes hear people argue in this way, maybe you've had discussions like this, people will say things like, well, uh, Austrians don't, are very skeptical about the benefits of state intervention, but we can see there are some countries that do very well under a system of state intervention. For example, in China, they have a very high growth rate, but even though they've freed up the economy very substantially from the days when they had the uh, full-fledged socialist system under the Maoists, it's still the case that a lot of industry is owned by the state. It's certainly not a free market utopia, but nevertheless, they have an extremely high growth rate. So how can it be, how can you say that economic intervention always has bad effects because look how well China is doing, or another example, uh, Paul Krugman, uh, the uh, Nobel Prize winning economist, has made this claim. He said, uh, people say that very prog progressive taxation interferes with productivity. It's bad for the economy. Progressive tax, is, no doubt, no, is one where people with higher income will pay not only more tax, but a higher rate of tax. They'll have a higher percentage of their, ta their income taken in taxes. So uh, Krugman and other people said, well, look, if you take the United States in the 1950s, there was a very high growth rate, but taxes were more progressive than they are now. So doesn't this show that uh, the economy can run very well. Uh, it, it, with, it's not the case that progressive taxation harms the economy because look how well the economy was doing even when we had progressive taxation. So what's wrong with this way of reasoning is that 
it isn't when they make these claims, say that the state state intervention does is very good for the economy or economy, progressive taxation doesn't harm the economy. These statements aren't put built up from a particular theory. They're just claims where they're uh, they're assertions that there's kind of a correlation of say, well, look, the economy, the Chinese economy is doing very well, it's growing very rapidly, but they, they, at the same time they have a lot of state intervention. So it can't be the case that the uh, state intervention is bad for the economy. So uh, you see this doesn't follow at all because all that we have here is a, a correlation between state intervention and high growth rate. That doesn't show there's a causal relationship between the two. It could be that, say, if you say that the Chinese economy would be doing even better than it is now if they didn't have extensive state intervention. That isn't ruled out by the fact that they're they're doing well when they do have state intervention. You see that we've just, if you're arguing this way, you're just giving certain correlations between things you aren't showing that there's a genuine causal relationship. Uh, now, to, do, to show there's a genuine causal relationship, we would have to build, we would have to build up a theory just in the way we do in Austrian economics from first principles. We would be showing how the, we would be able to have a theory saying why certain policies would lead to prosperity and why certain policies wouldn't. So if we have to have a coherent theory to do this, it isn't enough just to uh, point out certain correlations. Another example where people have done this, uh, people say, well, the United States, uh, say in the late 19th and 20th century, had a very high growth rate, but they also had high tariffs for long periods of time. So it must be the case that high tariffs don't hurt the economy, in fact, or an aid to economic growth. And you see, we have the same sort of mistake here. We're just saying there's correlation here. We haven't built up any theory showing how tariffs are beneficial. So now, if we follow the correct course of building up a theory, then suppose what we want to do is find out whether the economic effects of certain kinds of policies. Well, one thing that's extremely important to do, this is one point that Mises stressed very much, is that we have to take account all the effects of the measure that we're considering, not just some of the effects, we have to consider all the effects of it. Uh, so, and we're not, we don't give priority, say, just to the immediate effects, but we want to consider all the effects. Uh, now, some people have attacked uh, econom the economists such as Mises who say this. They say, well, this shows that Mises and other Austrians are just concerned with the long run, but what about the short run? Why shouldn't we prefer the short run? to the long run. In a famous article, uh, Keynes, Lord Keynes, who is not too well thought of in this, in this institute, uh, made the statement, in the long run, we're all dead. So he, he was there uh, making fun of those who emphasize the long run. So, so why, why, even if something has bad long-term effects, why shouldn't we follow that policy? Why, why, should the fact, why shouldn't we concentrate on the short run? For example, you'll uh, hear people today say, well, we're in a recession, so we need, the government needs to spend a lot of money. This might raise the debt, but that's something to worry about in the future. What's important is what we need to do now. Uh, we, we should, uh, why not emphasize the short run rather than the long run? So Mises, 
points, pointed out that he wasn't saying we should always prefer the long run to the short run, but simply that we should be aware of all the consequences, both short run and long run, so we don't, uh, we, we could then decide what to do on the basis of the fullest information we can come up with, rather than, just, it isn't a matter of saying we always have to prefer the long run. Uh, now, I want to give an example of how this method of analysis, where we take into account all the effects of a measure, or at least all the ones we can think of, uh, works in practice. Now, you'll sometimes hear arguments for protected tariffs along these lines. People will say, uh, supposing we have an industry, let's say, certain uh, uh, car manufacturing, and there are uh, foreign cars can undersell the cars that we have. So then unless we protect the, the car, this car industry, then the workers in, those, in this car industry will lose their jobs and this will be very bad for them and very bad for the economy because all those people will be out of work and then they won't be spending their money on at least very, as much money as they had before on things they would buy, so this will lead to a cycle where people will just stop spending and it'll have general bad effects. So we need a tariff so this won't happen. Now, of course, what this is overlooking is that uh, if the foreign firm was selling the cars at a lower price and the American firm was able to uh, to do, then the consumers are benefiting from the lower prices, then they have more money to spend on other things. So there's no net loss of, of uh, there's no net loss in production at all. On the contrary, people are able to have more resources available to spend on other things. And also, supposing then when uh, say the foreign firm makes money, they get American money for selling the, the cars, then they will then spend the money for um, American products that, they, that are exported to their country. So uh, the producers of these export industries benefit from that. So here you see it's quite different if we take account just the, sh the immediate consequences that these workers in the car industry are out of a job and we take account all the consequences. Well, this is helping the consumers. There'll be an increase in employment in uh, industries or products that the consumers spend their money on and the foreign people will be spending uh, the money they receive on American, at least in part, on American products. Now, it doesn't follow from what I've said. Uh, oh, I, I gave this one already. Uh, okay, now, uh, it doesn't follow from what I've said that economics can include it's wrong to impose the tariff. That would be a, a value judgment. Uh, it might be a very reasonable one to make, but that wouldn't follow from the economic analysis. What the economic analysis is, is just telling you what the effects of the tariff are. It doesn't tell you what you should do. It's just stating what the effects are. Now, uh, when you decide what to do, that is an ethical judgment on your part. It's a judgment about what you should do. Now, here again, it's important to avoid a mistake. It doesn't follow from what I've said that it's when I said that uh, when you give the effects of a tariff, it doesn't, it, that's just a descriptive statement, doesn't tell you what you ought to do. It doesn't follow from that that there are no objective criteria for what's right and wrong in ethics. It doesn't follow that all ethical judgments are just subjective expressions of preference. There could very well be objective 
there could very well be objectively true judgments about ethics that would tell you not to impose a tariff. I suspect there are, but all I was claiming is that this isn't part of economics. Economics is a descriptive science, and it, whether there is an objective ethics or not is not something that uh, is uh, uh, involved in economics. Economics doesn't make any judgments about that issue. And also, just to refine the point a little further, it doesn't follow from what I've said that judgments about ethics don't, are not consequences of descriptive statements about the world. That could be true, too. It's just that's not part of economic. So it could be that there is some correct theory of ethics in which it would follow just from the descriptions of the bad effects of tariffs that you ought not to impose them. That isn't ruled out either. But it's that, again, that isn't part of economics. Uh, now, I'll give another example of where we can use Austrian economics, a, a, a conclusion we, uh, that would be of help in analyzing a particular argument. Uh, some people, including a certain American president, who I won't mention by name, but we've got him now, <laughs> uh, have argued in this way. They say, well, it would be a good idea to impose uh, taxes on the very wealthy because the, the very wealthy aren't going to miss the money very much. If you have, say, a uh, hundred million dollars, say, losing a hundred thousand dollars isn't going to, a couple hundred thousand dollars isn't going to matter very much because, say, if we know from law of diminishing marginal utility, you'll put, when you get a, a valuable good, including money, you put the first unit to your most highly valued use, the next unit to your second most highly valued use, and so on. So when you get down to the last hundred thousand dollars for somebody who has hundreds of millions, it isn't going to be to a very valued use at all. So he isn't going to miss it very much, so you might as well take it. So you, you hear arguments like this with increasing frequency these days. Uh, so uh, in Austrian economics, we don't have a concept of utility in which this kind of reasoning would make sense, because in Austrian economics, remember, utility simply means your preference ranking for something. So when I have certain alternatives open to me, I just rank these alternative actions in the order that I want them. I have a choice between doing various actions. So I rank, say, this is the one I most prefer to, to do, this is the one I next most prefer, and so on. Then if I have a, a good such as money available, as I just mentioned, I would allocate the first unit to my most highly valued use, second unit to my next most highly valued use, and so on. But I wouldn't, I'm not making any judgment about how much I value one over the other. I'm not saying, well, the top one really gives me an enormous amount of satisfaction. This last one really doesn't matter at all. I'm not making any assessment of uh, psychological satisfactions in trying to figure out this utility of these. Uh, I just have a preference scale. And then again, what if once I get the preference scale, I couldn't compare this with somebody else's. I could compare them in the sense I could see what is on the other person's preference scale. But I couldn't say my first preference ranks higher or lower than this other person's second preference, because all you have, all you're given with this concept, the Austrian concept of utility, is a preference scale for each person. And it doesn't make sense in Austrian terms to say one person gets greater utility from money 
than someone else. So I see you couldn't make this argument about diminishing marginal utility in taxes that I've just given. Now I should say, sometimes you'll get a bad, what I consider at any rate bad or at least dubious arguments for the Austrian view. For example, people say, well, you can't measure an intensive magnitude, or intensive magnitude would be something psychological, but I don't think this is right. I mean, why can't you measure an intensive magnitude? Say you go into a hospital and they, at, they ask you to say how much pain you're in, you know, have a scale of one to 10. I'm always, I always say it's 10, you know, then they <laughs> give you more attention. But <laughs> I mean, I don't see anything intrinsically uh, absurd about that. So I mean, the point to bear in mind is we're not talking about a psychological magnitude at all. We just have a pure ranking of different choices. So the notion of magnitude uh, doesn't come into it. So that's why you can't use this concept of utility. Uh, so again, if we say this, we're not making an ethical judgment says, well, you shouldn't have taxes on the very rich because uh, that you shouldn't have taxes on the very rich. You might have reasons to tax them. It's just you can't say that the reason to have taxes on the rich is that they get less utility from their money than poor people do if you're using the Austrian concept of utility, you might be able to make such a claim if you use some sort of different concept of utility. But on the Austrian conception of utility, you couldn't make such a statement. So this is an example of how we can use Austrian theory to help us analyze particular uh, policy proposals. Uh, now, uh, so far, I've made a sharp distinction between ethics and economics. I've been saying, well, economics makes descriptive statements, and we have to be very careful to distinguish ethical, ethical statements, statements about what we ought or ought not to do from the descriptive statements of economics. Now, one of Mises' very valuable contributions was he certainly believed in this very sharp separation between ethics and economics. Nevertheless, he thought that the economist can sometimes make statements about that are very, that are, have ethical significance in deciding what to do. So even though economics is a purely descriptive science, you can nevertheless make certain judgments about policies that don't involve value judgments on your part. Uh, how could you do that? Well, uh, Mises said you can show that in certain cases you can ask, will a particular policy achieve the ends that the people who propose the policy want for it? So, if you could show that a measure would be unsuccessful, then you would have a good reason not to do that. You wouldn't be making an ethical judgment. You'd be saying, even on your own grounds, you shouldn't favor this measure because you won't get what you want from it. So here it would just be an appeal to general principle of rationality. You ought to do it would be, it's rational for you to do what will achieve your ends, not what won't achieve them. You wouldn't be making a controversial value judgment, or at least he would, Mises would say you wouldn't be making a value judgment at all. Uh, now, an example, this is what one that Mises gives, is suppose the government thinks that the price of milk is too high, say, they're poor people who can't afford milk. They need the milk to give it to their babies, but they can't afford it. So this is a very bad thing. So the government proposes, well, they'll uh, 
have price controls on milk, so then people uh, won't, uh, will then the poor people will be able to have more milk available. So you might think, well, you might say uh, this isn't a good idea because this interferes with the rights of the milk producers to set prices uh, in whatever way they want, but this would be an ethical judgment. This would be involve some judgment about what people's rights would be, but can the economists say anything about the price control that doesn't make any appeal to any ethical theory, even if it's a correct ethical theory? And Mises said, yes, the economist could, because he could say, well, the effect of the price control will be that milk producers won't make as much milk available because, uh, or at least it might be that, because at a, uh, if the price is lower, it will be lower than the, uh, than the amount they want. Say, at it's that, the, let me put this, word this better, at the price the government has set, the, if it's below the market price, then the milk producers will not supply as much milk as they would have done at the market price. So the result of the government measure will be to lower the amount of milk available. But just what they wanted was to increase the amount of milk available, not to lower it. So this is an example where the price control would lead to a result that was contrary to what the people who wanted the price control favored. So Mises said, just if we stick within the terms of descriptive economics, we can have a reason to oppose the price control rather than accept it, because from the point of view of the people who advocate it, it isn't going to succeed. So I think we're, uh, we have a few minutes left if there are any questions, objections, maybe people have better jokes than I did. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, the, that was a very good question. The question was, how do we know that the logical framework will always yield valid conclusions? Well, we're just following standard logic. You know, I mean, that's not too controversial. I mean, it's been around for a long time. It's, uh, do you think that it might, are, are you suggesting it might turn out to be, that might turn out that the ordinary rules of logic are wrong, or do you think it's just an empirical hypothesis, or? I don't know, I was wondering how. Oh, well, I, I mean, it's just, well, again, we would just think about them and we'd grasp that they are true. It's a similar process. You, you know, just uh, see that these rules are, the basic rules are correct. They're evident to us, and then we can go on we can go on from there. I mean, it's, it, it isn't that there's some super science of logic that shows that logic is correct. It's, this is what we take to be the starting point, and we directly grasp at least certain principles of truth are true. Now, there are, there are some logicians, especially uh, modern logicians, who think they're so-called alternative logics that don't reject certain standard logical laws, for example, there's logics that uh, don't accept the principle of excluded middle, or there's some who people who reject the law of non-contradiction. But I don't think that those, uh, those views are really, those views are really hard to follow the, why they think that. At uh, one point, uh, Saul Kripke was one of the Leading modern philosophers point out that if you're going to state the rules of these alternative logics, you have so-called alternative logics, you have to do those in terms of the standard logic. So it's kind of their status is rather questionable. So I think basically 
Again, we're just using ordinary reasoning and logic. If that turned out to be wrong, we'd really be in a lot of trouble because that's what we use in our ordinary life. We, that we, really, we would really have had it if ordinary logic turns out to be wrong. Well, it, inductive reasoning isn't used in the formulating the praxeology and the theory. You could certainly use inductive reasoning in historical matters or in uh, giving particular examples. Uh, I'm in my lecture this afternoon on where I talk about uh, history. I'll be giving something about inductive reasoning. So. Uh, I'll deal with that a bit in, in that lecture. Uh, yes? Um, what would be the implications to economic reasoning if there's some neurobiologist who came up with a way to measure satisfaction? Uh, oh. Uh, well, you see, again, if such a thing were to happen, assuming that's possible, uh, that would have no effect at all on the concept of utility is Austrian economists are using because that would simply be, remember, it's simply a ranking of choices. It isn't a ranking based on your estimate of some kind of psychological satisfaction that you have in them. So it isn't something like, well, I'm going to choose the one, the alternative available that gives me kind of a certain thrill and I'll measure this compared to the thrill I get from other thing, see if I would do it by thrills, I obviously wouldn't be giving this lecture right now, would I? But uh, you, you, even more certainly, you wouldn't be here uh, listening to me. But again, it isn't some sort of psychological measure, it's some measure of psychological satisfaction. It's a pure preference ranking. So if you, if you were to come up with some, some way of measuring satisfaction, that wouldn't affect the Austrian view of utility at all. It's a different concept altogether. Uh, yeah. Um, would you please comment on the differential similarity between the post evidence um, activities between Atkins and those mentioned in the record and the evidence that they're looking at? Ah, well, uh, it's interesting. You see, when Jefferson said, remember, he says, we hold these truths. That seems to be saying, well, we're going to take these to be basic, even though they might not be. You know, he said, well, if something's self-evident, you don't hold it to be self-evident. It is or it isn't. So I think there, uh, if you thought that those statements, Declaration of Independence, really were self-evident, then it would be quite the same as an Austrian. It would just be something you're directly grasping to be true, but it's not clear that Jefferson himself wanted to be taken that way, but if he did, that would be what he was saying. The self-evident doesn't refer to the content of what you claim to be self-evident, it's just how you claim to know it. Okay, thank you.